What's up, Buck Douglas in the garage. Today we're gonna to talk about some more crazy automotive history, some crazy Jeep history, and it's something that a lot of people don't talk about. It is the fact that Jeep has been owned by so many different companies and been influenced by even more companies over its long storied existence as a brand. So today we're gonna to go through the full chain of ownership of the Jeep brand. And I have identified 11 different entities that have either owned or heavily influenced the Jeep brand. Uh, and we're gonna go through them all today. We're gonna talk about some of the iconic vehicles that were released during each stage of its ownership. And we are just going to celebrate the Jeep brand in automotive history a little bit because who in the world doesn't love doing that? Now, when you talk about Jeep history, I have identified three very distinct eras. Uh, the first is the pre-1963 era. The next is the Kaiser era. AMC era, and the final is the Chrysler era. Now there are multiple ownerships in each of those, but those are the three eras we're gonna kind of break down, and you'll see as we're going through it, how each era kind of is its own uh, very separate thing. All right, our story starts with the American Bantam Car Company. Their engineer, Carl Probst, designed the very first prototype that would later become the Jeep. It wasn't called the Jeep yet, it was called the Bantam Blitz Buggy. This was to satisfy a government contract. In 1941, the government was looking for a new 4x4 vehicle, both for our army and to supply our allies via Lend-Lease in World War II as we were not yet in World War II. Bantam created almost 2,700 examples of this first, we'll just call it a Jeep, uh, which was distributed mostly to Britain, a few to the Soviet Union, a few to the US uh, government. They liked the vehicle, but the engine was underpowered. They put it out to two other auto brands, Ford Motor Company and uh, Willis Overland. Willis Overland was able to improve the engine. Ford made some other improvements. And what we ultimately got was a Willis redesign of the Bantam vehicle. At this point, Bantam's ownership of Jeep is completely over. Uh, they did not secure the entire contract. They didn't believe that they had the capacity to build what was needed to supply the war effort. They were right. So in the end, Bantam built some things, but but Ford and Willis built the majority of what we know as the World War II Jeeps. At this point, we can bring in the first company that can really claim ownership of the Jeep brand, and that's the Willis Overland Company. Now, during World War II, nobody owned the Jeep brand. It was just a design that several companies were building. Now, one thing Willis did during World War II is they had an extensive advertising campaign uh, kind of associating these Jeep vehicles with Willis, even though that really wasn't the case at the time, but that ultimately helped lead to them being awarded the trademark in 1950. 50. It uh, should be noted an interesting thing. King Features Syndicate, which is a comic book company, has held a trademark on the name Jeep since 1936 for a character in Popeye cartoons known as Eugene the Jeep. A lot of people, including myself, believe that this is in fact where the Jeep name comes from. Eugene the Jeep was a magical little creature that could go anywhere and do anything, so you can pretty clearly see how that would be associated. After the war, Willis took this vehicle and they wanted to make the Jeep, the civilian Jeep, the CJ 2A, a, an agricultural vehicle. Think about the Unimog, what the Unimog was in Germany at this time. It had, you could get any attachment for a CJ 2A. You could get a backhoe for it. You could get a tiller. You could get literally anything. And they envisioned a vehicle that the var farmer would use in his fields all week and then could take the family into town uh, on the weekend. Kind of do away with the dual purpose, having a pickup truck and having a tractor. This is really how they marketed it until 1953 when Kaiser buys the Willis Overland Automotive Company. Now at this point, Willys is is still making automobiles, but by far Jeep is what's selling for them. Uh, Kaiser buys them in 1955, they kill off the car brand. In 1954, the CJ5 is released. Now, arguably, the CJ5 is potentially one of the most important vehicles to Jeep because of how long it ran, how versatile it was, and the things we were able to do it. That was released under Kaiser. Now, Kaiser kept the Willys Overland name until 1963. This is where we end the pre-1963 era, and you're gonna see why in a minute. In 1963, Kaiser changes the name from Willis Overland, and they're selling Jeeps, to Kaiser Jeep, and they're selling Jeeps, all right? In 1963, another incredibly important thing happened. Now, picture this, before 1963, you got a couple trucks, panel vans, fleet vans, um, other odd vehicles, CJ5, but in 1963, you get the Gladiator pickup truck and you get the Wagoneer. And the, this event, along with Kaiser changing the name to Kaiser Jeep, uh, this is what changes the era. And you're gonna see now, Jeep goes from being kind of abstract, kind of a utilitarian, only existing in a work capacity, because all the vehicles before this were work vehicles. CJ2A, you're out in the field, the CJ, um, uh, five had similar attachments and things for it. You had panel vans, fleet vans, delivery trucks. Now you've got the Wagoneer. 
family vehicle, right? That's what the Wagoneer was for. You've got the pickup truck, the Gladiator, an everyman truck. And this is what brings us into what I like to call Jeep becoming America's brand. Now I know that that could be highly contested, but I do believe that Jeep is America's brand. And I actually have another, I have other videos where I rant on that. I wanna keep this video concise. If you're interested in anything that I'm saying here, there's a very good chance that it's represented somewhere else in another one of my videos. Now with this new Kaiser AMC era, starting in 1963, I already mentioned in 63, the Wagoneer and the Gladiator. In 1967, the M715, which is a military version of the Gladiator is introduced, an incredibly important and iconic vehicle. And even more important, Potentially more important even than the Wagoneer is in 1967 when Kaiser Jeep releases the Commando. Now the Commando is not super well known today unless you are really into Jeeps, but the Commando is an incredibly important vehicle in the history and transformation of the Jeep brand. At the time, it was designed to go after what they were calling the leisure 4x4 movement. That's your original Ford Bronco. That's your original Land Cruiser. That's people, I think we'd call it overlanding today, probably. People want to be able to take their family vehicle and, I don't know, drive it into the woods, drive it on a beach, do a little bit of incredibly mild off-roading, but they want that capacity. They want the 4x4, but they still want to be comfortable. They don't want a CJ5, which is rough and tumble. They, they want a Wagoneer which at this point would still have been uh, kind of like a, just a family SUV. The Commando is sporty, it's fun. And when you compare the Commando to the Bronco today, it does not make a ton of sense. But if you look at the Commando from 1967 and the uh, similar era Bronco, they actually look very similar and there are different options for the Commando. So you could really create a very sporty, capable, comfortable vehicle this is super important. This kind of thinking would not have happened under the original Willis Overland Company. They were going in a strictly utilitarian uh fashion and Kaiser comes in and they say, hold on, man, we can make Jeep America's brand and this is how we're going to do it. Now, Kaiser holds on to Jeep from 1953 until 1970, at which point Kaiser is not doing super well and they need to sell off the Jeep, the Kaiser Jeep name. They sell it to the American Motor Company. The American Motor Company gets it in 1970 and the very first thing they do in 1971 is they spin off all of Jeep's commercial, postal, and government contracts to another subsidiary of AMC that they have just created AM General. So military Jeeps of the time were not really being made by AMC, they would be made by AM General. This is important down the road for the Renault merger, but we will talk about that later. Now, just to talk about AM General real quick, not that it has any bearing on this story, when AMC failed, Chrysler bought AMC, they did not buy AM General. GM bought AM General. Uh, since AM General under AMC had developed the Humvee, that's how the Hummer ended up being a GM vehicle. If Chrysler had picked it up, the Hummer would would have in fact been a Chrysler vehicle. The AMC half of the Kaiser AMC era is fun. That's the only way you can describe it. Jeeps become fun. There are just tens of models for every, you got the CJ5 and there's a million different, the Golden Eagle, the Renegade, this, that, and the third, uh, the, the Tuxedo. They're just a bunch of different uh, versions, uh, whether they're appearance packages or performance packages, there's a Jeep for everybody under AMC. Some really important ones to note, well, first of all, the 1970 release of the DJ Dispatch. This is a two-wheel drive dispatch vehicle. A lot of them were right-hand drive for the postal service or other delivery services. It's, it's a CJ5, it's only got five slats instead of seven in the front, and um, they were delivery vehicles. They were bare bones. Um, they're really cool. Uh, when you think of the iconic male Jeep, that you're picturing a DJ. Another incredibly important vehicle during this time, the 1970 release of the SJ Cherokee. Uh, I have a history of the Cherokee nameplate. Go check that out if you want more, but the SJ Cherokee is an incredibly cool vehicle. It's an incredibly important vehicle, and it helped to build up Jeep's off-road credibility outside of just the CJ Wrangler line. Incredibly important vehicle, uh, released in 1975 under AMC, and then of course 1976 the release of the CJ7 which at the time was a massive shakeup. The CJ5 had been around since 1954 uh, and when you thought of Jeep you thought of a CJ5. We kind of see CJ5 and CJ7 as being very similar today not so at the release. In fact CJ5 guys hated CJ7s at the time the way CJ7 guys hated Wranglers blah 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 on down the line as is the tradition. Now something interesting happens in 1979 AMC is not doing well. They're not doing well 
because of themselves. Jeep is selling fine, but their own cars are not selling well. They kind of bet the farm on the Hornet and it didn't necessarily work out the way they hoped. So Renault, the French automaker Renault, steps in and they start to buy up percentages of AMC. Another thing Renault does at this time is they start selling AMC products, including Jeeps, through their European dealership networks. So with Renault's help, Jeep is starting to get more of a global presence. Another reason that is incredibly important that Renault steps in here is they become heavily involved in the design of new vehicles, specifically the XJ and the ZJ. ZJ we'll talk about later, but the XJ, the 1984 XJ Cherokee, the first unibody Jeep, the Jeep that changed what Jeeps could be, was heavily influenced by Renault engineers, and it would not have been what it was without them, and potentially it would not have been as good. Knowing how good it is, we have to appreciate Renault's part in all this. Additionally, Renault is uh, responsible for the Renix fuel injection, which there are two uh, sides of the court on that one. Some guys like it quite a bit, other people do not. I've never owned one, but I have worked on them, and since I'm not familiar with them, I'm not a big fan of Renix fuel injection on Jeeps. Uh, the, the Chrysler version is much better. But Renault, obviously responsible for that. Renix is a mix of the word Renault and the company name Bendix. Renix, real creative there. So, uh, unfortunately, the Renault in involvement was not enough to save AMC. In 1987, led by Lee Iacocca, Chrysler steps in and they buy AMC. Why do they buy AMC? For the Jeep brand, plain and simple. That's what Lee Iacocca wanted. And more specifically, Lee Iacocca wanted the ZJ. He saw the plans for the ZJ, what they were working on, and he said, wow, man, I just recently revolutionized the small car market in the United States. I just invented the minivan. This would be the perfect go-between. This is what I need on my Chrysler lineup. The original lifted minivan, the ZJ Grand Cherokee. So Chrysler comes in and they start to modernize the line. All right. This is the end of the uh, AMC Kaiser era. Not just because of the names. Obviously, they're named that because Kaiser and AMC owned them at that time. But what Chrysler does, they come in and they modernize the lineup in a good way, in a positive way. Now, unfortunately, this means the J-Series trucks have to go away in 87. The Wagoneer has to go away in 91. And the Comanche has to go away in 92. But what we get in the 90s is, in my opinion, the greatest Jeep lineup of all time. You have the ZJ Grand Cherokee, you have the XJ Cherokee, and you have the YJ Wrangler. And the TJ Wrangler at the end. The 90s lineup that Lee Iacocca curated is just a powerhouse and I wish I had been born 20 years earlier so that I could have owned one or all of those Jeeps new from the factory. We pretty much mentioned the iconic Jeeps. The 93 ZJ was huge. It redefined the sport utility vehicle. Uh, additionally, of course, you have the 97 release of the TJ Wrangler, which compared to today's standards is really just a refresh of the YJ. New suspension, new styling, but still in the same vein. Now, unfortunately, we come on slightly dark days. In 1998, Chrysler is bought out in what is called a merger with Daimler, and we get Daimler Chrysler. I wanted to do a whole video just on the Daimler Chrysler relationship, but regular car reviews already did one, and other than their unwavering hate of all things Chrysler. It's a really good video. So if you want the whole history on the Daimler Chrysler merger and partnership, go check that out. I may even link it somewhere. The problem with the Daimler Chrysler merger is that it made no sense and it made the least amount of sense for Jeep. During this time, we start to see Jeeps becoming more luxury oriented and more normalized. And that's not good for a niche brand like Jeep that's always survived by being the oddball. Now, of course, during this time, we get the WJ, which is potentially my favorite Jeep of all time. This was already in place. This is from just the Chrysler days and it just happened to exist flopping over into the Daimler Chrysler days. What we do get that is a direct result of the Daimler Chrysler is the 2005 WK Grand Cherokee. Now, not that this is a bad vehicle, but it's the beginning of the departure of the everyman Jeep and you start to see more luxury items the interior of the WK is probably one of the worst interiors I've ever sat in. That goes for the XK Commander as well. Now, it doesn't make it a bad vehicle, but you just start to see this disconnect between what the Jeep brand was and what they clearly want it to be. And a lot of the vehicles from this time are not well known or well renowned. Now, additionally, during this time, you get the 2007 release of the JK Wrangler, which was a complete 
and total success. It was also a complete and total departure from the old way of thinking, which would be your CJ, YJ, and TJ, but there is nobody on the planet who could argue, I mean, you could dislike things about the JK, but the JK release was a complete success. Sold really well, did really well, and it furthered the brand in a really positive way. Additionally, during this time, we get the 04 Wrangler Unlimited we're doing right now as we as I'm recording this we are doing a March Madness uh, Jeep um uh, best Jeep of all time March Madness bracket and the LJ is in the final four it could be crowned the greatest Jeep of all time uh, you also get the 06 XK which I have argued and planned to do a whole video on that if this ve vehicle had come at a different time it would have been a smash hit but it came right at a time when gas guzzlers gas guzzlers hate that term we're on the down a swing and then it, right in the middle of its run you get the 08 recession I mean the thing is a giant shoebox tank on wheels it didn't stand a chance in that particular um, area in that particular time now after this something incredibly strange happens uh, when Daimler and Chrysler finally decide to part ways Daimler needs somebody to buy Chrysler from them and it went to a company called the Cerberus Capital Management Group which was a company that had absolutely zero experience in the automotive world. Let's break down their name for a second. I, I think this is gonna be important. Cerberus, for those who don't know, is the multi-headed dog who guards the gates of hell in Greek mythology, known as the Hound of Hades. Now I'm assuming the imagery this company was going for was the multi-head imagery, but in this case, uh, really just the gates of hell is what's kind of coming through. They mismanaged the hell out of Chrysler and everybody suffered. They held the company from 2007 to 2009 and in 2009 Chrysler has to file for bankruptcy. Now, this is a direct result of the recession, of course, but it's also a direct result of Cerberus's mismanagement of the company. What happens after that bankruptcy, they're bailed out by the government, corporate bailout, big deal, second time in Chrysler's history. They come out of that as the uh, Chrysler Group LLC with a number of different people owning stake. One company that's owning stake is the Fiat Motor Company. All right, so at this point, Chrysler Group LLC exists from 2009 to 2013. I like to call this time period, actually 2009 to the present, a return to Jeep's form, but in the context of the new normal. Jeep was changed so much during that Daimler Chrysler and Cerberus time period, we could never go back to what we were before. We could never become the niche market vehicle. We were normalized too much. Um, but what happens with Fiat is we, we, we start to get back to some of the fun. So where that brings us to our 11th and final owner or influencer. Since 2014, Chrysler, and by extension Jeep, has been in a, a merger with Fiat. Fiat more or less owns Chrysler at this point, but they do keep the two companies relatively separate while being under the same umbrella, though there are crossovers. They do use the same platform on both uh, companies. Jeep is in a great spot. Jeep is selling like crazy. They've released the new Wrangler, the JLJLU. We've got the Jeep pickup truck. We have promise of a new Grand Cherokee coming. We have promise of a new Wagoneer coming that may even be full frame on a truck frame. That would be insane. For the first time since 1991, we would have a family mover full frame Jeep. So the Jeep brand is doing great. It's doing its best to hold on to that fun, rugged image that it built all those years ago, slogging it out with CJ5 and the Commando. Uh, but we have to stop and think about how odd the brand is. A lot of the companies that owned Jeep over the years, they owned Jeep and they made other things. They went under, the other things died off, Jeep went on to live on. Willis Overland made Jeeps and cars. They get killed off, the cars go away, Jeep moves on. Kaiser made Jeeps and cars. Um, the Jeeps move on, the cars don't. AMC made Jeeps and cars. The cars died off, Jeep moved on. Uh, even to some extent Chrysler, though they have Dodge mixed in there, but Chrysler doesn't really, they don't make anything anymore. What do you buy that's a Chrysler, a Pacifica? They don't make the 200 or the 300 anymore, I don't think. Um, Jeep has this incredible ability to survive, and it's one of the reasons, and adapt, survive and adapt, and it's one of the reasons why I call it America's brand. Uh, it just, in my opinion, there's no better vehicle company, regardless of who owns them, that better embodies the American spirit, the American dream, and the American way of life than a Jeep. And that's all there is to say about it. I will link another video where I talked about who owns Jeep today if you want some more information on Fiat Chrysler. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have a bunch of videos down there if you liked this Jeep. 
Jeep history video. I've got a bunch of Jeep history and a bunch of general automotive history. You're probably looking for more and more stuff to watch as you are completing all of Netflix and Hulu in this crazy time of quarantine. May I invite you to check out more videos by D&E, whether they're wrenching videos or sitting here screaming at you about history videos. All right, if you like the video, by all means like the video. That's just common sense. Why would you like a video and not like the video, right? So yeah, leave us that comment down in the squawk boxes. Let us know what you think about this group of 11 different uh, owners and influencers that have been a part of this crazy Jeep story that is coming up on 100 years. The brand is coming up on 100 years old in what? Just over two decades. I hope I'm alive for it. Hope it's gonna be a hell of a party. I wanna give a quick shout out to our patrons over there on Patreon. This whole story came from them. I said, hey man, what do you guys wanna see? And a few things were kicked around. I got a few more videos coming, but this was at the top of the list. They said, let's go through the chain of ownership. So this came directly from our patrons. I truly appreciate all of you. I love the conversations we have over on that platform. If you're interested on in getting in on it, uh, go check us out over there. I'm gonna end this video here. As always, thanks for watching. See you next time.